Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak in the number theory seminar. And I'm going to be talking about this joint work with Vladimir Chudronsov and Igor Repinchuk. In fact, in the first half of the talk, we'll be concerned with the following question. Well, suppose we have two finite dimensional central division algebras over a field K. How are these algebras related given the fact that they, ha they have the same maximal subfield? Of course, to have the same maximal subfields means the following. First of all, it means to have the same degree and then satisfy the following condition. A degree and extension of the center embeds into one algebra if and only if it embeds into the other. And well, there are several reasons that make this question worth looking at. In fact, we first came across this question, the joint work with Gopal Prasad, thinking about locally symmetric spaces. Some years ago, we proved that in many, although not in all situations, two arithmetically defined local symmetric spaces uh, uh, having the same length of closed geodesics are commensurable. Now, for arithmetic Riemann surfaces, uh, this, this result was obtained earlier by Alan Reed. But the important point is that the underlying algebraic fact is the following that if we have two quaternion division algebras over a number field, then if they have the same maximal subfields, then they are necessarily isomorphic. Well, of course, most Riemann surfaces are not arithmetic. So in order to get at least some handle on the situation, uh, we better be able to uh, know what happens over fields more general than number fields. Well, to explain this point, so let me show you how algebras having the same, uh, or many of the same uh, et al subalgebras arise in the geometric setting. So let H be the upper half plane. Then as everybody knows, most human surfaces are obtained by taking quotients of H by some discrete torsion-free subgroup of PSL to R. It turns out that certain properties of this Riemann surface can be understood in terms of the associated quaternion algebra. So a good reference for that is the book by McLaughlin and Reed, where they have lots and lots of examples and explanations. Uh, here's how this associated quaternion algebra is constructed. So let pi be the usual homomorphism. Okay, what we do is we lift our discrete subgroup into uh, SL to R, and then we consider the following. We consider the uh, subalgebra of M and M to R generated over Q by, well, for technical reasons, you need to, to take not the original subgroup gamma, but rather the subgroup generated by squares to get the right algebra and the right field. So that's what we do. So we take the subgroup of gamma tilde generated by, by squares, and then inside M to R, we generate a Q sub algebra. That's all we do. Then one shows that this algebra, A sub gamma, is actually a quaternion algebra whose center is a so called trace field. So it's generated by the traces of the elements in our discrete subgroup. And the point is that, of course, for general Fuchsian groups, the center doesn't have to be a number field. It can be actually any finitely generated subgroup, a subfield of, of R. Okay, the significance of that algebra is the following. So if our subgroup is arithmetic, then this algebra is precisely the quaternion algebra that is needed for its description. So it uniquely determines our subgroup. Now, in more general situations, of course, this, the algebra does not determine the subgroup, but at least it's an invariant of the commensurability class. It's a weak invariant, but in, at least it's some invariant. Okay, now I have the algebra. So now let me explain how closed geodesics in the Riemann surface are related to the maximal et al subalgebras of that algebra. Well, uh, given a semi simple element in our discrete subgroup, then geometrically to that element, one can associate a closed geodesic in our manifold in our Riemann surface. So we don't need to, the exact construction. What's important is that the length of that closed geodesic is the logarithm of the eigenvalue, which is greater than 1. 
Well, on the other hand, algebraically, corresponding to this element, we have this et al sub algebra of our quaternion algebra. So given a Riemannian manifold a M, traditionally by L of M, we denote the set of lengths of all closed geodesics in M. It's the so-called weak length spectrum. So this is just a, a sequence of numbers without multiplicities. Okay, and now we make the following definition. So Riemannian manifolds M1 and M2 are said to be isolength spectral if they have the same weak length spectra. Okay. And we say that these manifolds are lengths commensurable if the set of all rational multiples of the lengths of all, all closed geodesics in one of them coincides with the set of all rational multiples of the sets of closed geodesics in the other one. No, no, for us, L of M is just a subset of R. So we don't count multiplicities. Okay. Now, returning to our Riemann surfaces, well, suppose we have two Riemann surfaces corresponding to the subgroups gamma 1 and gamma 2. And now let's assume that they are commensurable. Then first of all, one proves that they have the same trace subfield. Okay. Now, if we have closed geodesics, in each of those Riemann surfaces, and then assuming that the ratio of the length is a rational number, we get the following sum power of gamma 1 is conjugate to sum power of uh, gamma 2. So implying that this algebra generated by gamma 1 and gamma 2 are actually isomorphic. So if uh, our Riemann surfaces happen to be length commensurable, then the corresponding uh, quaternion algebras have lots and lots of common et al subalgebras. I'm not saying all, uh, but it's a technical, uh, technical detail. So in fact, for results like finiteness, it's enough to look at only those subalgebras that intersect a given uh, the risky dense subgroup. But I will not get into this technical details. So in any case, these algebras share lots and lots of, of common tall subalgebras. On the other hand, so our Riemann surfaces M1 and M2 can be commensurable only if the algebras are the same. Okay. So whenever you want to prove that your length commensurable Riemann surfaces M1 and M2 are in fact commensurable, well, explicitly you are answering that question that I have here. So we need to show that, well, we are given that our quaternion algebras have lots and lots of common et al. subalgebras. What we want to prove at the end is that uh, these algebras are the same. Well, more concretely, so if instead of length commensurability, we use a much stronger relation, namely isospectrality, then we have this fo the, fo the following finiteness results. So if we have a compact Riemann surface, then compact Riemann surfaces that are isospectral to M split into finitely many uh, isometric classes. Okay. And then one, one may wonder what happens if we look at length commensurable Riemann surfaces. So ideally, of course, one would like to prove that they will split into finitely many commensurability classes. We don't know how to prove that, at least not yet, but at least we can prove that the following statement for uh, the corresponding quaternion algebras. So if we look at a family of length commensurable Riemann surfaces, and here I don't need to assume compact or even finite volume. So for me, it's enough to assume that gammas are just the risky dense. Then the quaternion algebras corresponding to this, these Riemann surfaces will split into finitely many isomorphism classes, at least over a common set. So this uses the results on that question start that I'm going to talk about later. Any questions? Well, if you find this geometric motivation a bit far-fetched, there is an algebraic one. Namely, there is a famous theorem due to Amit Sur that states the following. Suppose we have two central division algebras over K. If these algebras have the same splitting fields, 
which means that an extension of k splits one of them, if and only if it splits the other, then these algebras are very much related. Namely, the corresponding classes in the Brouwer group generate the same subgroup. The proof of this theorem uses so-called generic splitting fields, in other words, the function fields of severy Brouwer varieties, which are, of course, infinite extensions of k. And one may wonder what happens if we are, are allowed to use just only finite extensions of k. In other words, can you prove Amitsur's theorem using only extensions of finite degree or just the maximal subtotals in your algebra? And the answer turns out to be no, and counterexamples can be constructed already using cubic algebras over algebraic number fields. So it fails in a big way, and that, but in order to understand what really happens, one is led to consider this question star and its variations. Uh, so when we came across this question, yes. So you just, you just use local invariance. You use uh, Albert Hasse Brauer Noether theorem, and you place invariance and change signs or something like that. So it, you can construct algebras uh, ramified at four places with invariance one third and negative one third. So you, you need to shuffle them properly, and then you get you get counterexamples. Uh, so when we came across this question, so we started looking through the literature, and not much seemed to be known at that point. So in our paper, we asked the following simple-minded question. So the simplest field beyond you know, number fields is the field of rational functions over Q. So the question was that are quaternion algebras over that field uniquely determined by their maximal subfields? And soon afterwards, so David Saltman show that it's indeed the case. And then a bit later, in a joint work with Skip Garibaldi, they show that the answer is still yes if we look at the field of rational functions over a number field. That was the beginning of this activity. And today, we know a little bit more. And in the rest of the talk, I'm going to show you some results. I mean, are there some transcendence things that are input into the proof? Well, I, I will mention this later. So what you need is you need the unramified Brouwer group. So the result that plays the role is that the unramified Brouwer group over purely transcendental extension is the Brouwer group of the field of constants. I have a question. Yeah? Um, take the division algebra and take its opposite. They have a similar I, I'll get to this. Thank you for that uh, remark. So I'll get to this. Yeah. yeah. But they may not be isomorphic, right? Unless right, unless the, the, the algebra has exponent 2 in the Brouwer group. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I, I will get to this. Yes, but, but it's still, you know, just one counterexample. So, <laughs> understood. Counter. Yeah, thank you for that. In fact, you can do even better. So you can uh, take your algebra of degree n yeah. and raise it to the powers of prime to n in the Brouwer group. Mm -hmm. They will all have the same subfields. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yes. So you cannot get less than this. So for quaternions, this means that it's just the, this quaternion algebra. For other algebras, you're absolutely right. You cannot get less than this. The question is whether you get something else. So because here, I, I'm not saying that I would like my algebras to be isomorphic. Your example shows that it, it's simply not true. But how are they related? So it would be ideal if you could say that, of course, one of them is the power of the other in the Brouwer group. That would be ideal, and you cannot do better than that. But before I show you some results, so let me try to, to quantify the problem. So let's give the definition of the genus. So let D be a finite dimensional central division algebra, so we field K. We define the genus of D to be the collection of all Brouwer classes that are defined by division algebras having the same maximal subgroups as the original algebra D. Once a person working in quadratic forms told me that every use of the word genus <laughs> is subject to some restrictions. So you better have a very good reason for that. <laughs> so it should be of local global nature, and it should always be finite. Well, we will see this local global interplay a bit later. It's expressed in the analysis for ramification. 
But the bad news is that the, uh, the genus, this genus can be infinite. Although this can happen only in very wild situations. And I will show you how this. this is the same as uh, asking that they have the same splitting with respect to finite extensions? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> maximal subfields, I exactly no. I mean, we don't know, really. But uh, so we use maximal subfields as a basis. So uh, Danny Krushen used um, uh, finite dimensional splitting fields. So for rational function fields, we've got the same results. But we don't really know whether these, these notions are equivalent or not. But does this notion have an analog for a general semi-simple group? Or something? Yeah, yeah, I'll get to this. And we were interested primarily in the following question. So when does the genus reduce to a single element? As we now know, it's not always the case. But when does this happen? Of course, this simply means that your division algebra D is uniquely determined by the maximal subfields. Whenever we have an algebra with the same subfields, it must be isomorphic to D. And the second question is, when is the genus finite? Okay, on over number fields, again, both questions can be easily answered. So the genus of any quaternion algebra reduces to one element. And then, uh, if we have an algebra other than a quaternion algebra, the genus is always non-trivial, but it is always finite. In fact, you can fix a field, you can fix the degree uh, other than two, and then you construct, uh, construct an algebra whose genus has size more than a prescribed number. So the genus can be arbitrarily large, but finite. So these facts, uh, are consequences of the description of the Brown group of, of n number fields. So uh, both facts follow from the famous Albert Husser Brown universal theorem, which describes uh, a division algebra over number field or the Brown class over a number field in terms of the local invariance. Uh, speaking about Fields more general than number fields. So first of all, we have the following, what we call the stability result. So namely, if we have a field of characteristic not two, and we know that the genus is trivial uh, for every quaternion algebra over k, then the same property holds for the field of rational functions. So that sort of generalizes Saltman's result. The same statement remains valid for algebras of exponent two okay, in, in the Brouwer group. So uh, namely, if we have a field and we know that every algebra of exponent two is uniquely determined by its maximal subfields, then the same property transfers up to the field of, of rational functions. You can do better. You can look at fields of some severely Brouwer varieties, but that's the essence of this result. And now I get to your, your comment, of course, we know th that the genus of, of every algebra that is not of exponent two. This is a different question to uh, quadratic forms in four variables, in which are the known forms of these, and their genera. It's it, 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 it is related. It's related as follows. So uh, if we have a quaternion. Right. So let, let me show you the precise way they are related. So let's look at the quaternion algebra that corresponds to the pair A, B, or some field K. Yeah. Then uh, its reduced norm is the following thing. So then the subfields of D are characterized precisely by the imaginary part of the reduced form, of the reduced norm. Namely, an extension like this embeds into D if and only if D is represented by negative this form. Okay. 
On the other hand, so two quaternion algebras are isomorphic even only if these imaginary parts are equivalent as quadratic forms. So the question we're looking at is the following. So suppose I have two ternary forms like this with discriminant one they, that represent the same elements. Okay, are they equivalent? That's the, the other side of that question. As I said, the bad news is that this genus can be infinite. Okay. Well, this can be shown by adapting a certain construction that was used by many people. This list is incomplete. Shahir, Garibaldi, Saltman. So I should add Rost, Wadsworth, and other people. Uh, this construction can be adapted, and this was done by uh, Jeff Meyer. So to construct quaternion algebras over large fields with infinite genus. And that construction was generalized by Sergei Tikhonov to construct algebras of over, yeah, I'll explain this. We will see this. So you'll probably agree that it's difficult to imagine an al two quotidian algebras that have the same subfields but not isomorphic. Therefore, I will tell you something about that construction. Now, to keep my notation simple, instead of shooting for infinite genus, I will first try to construct two algebras that are not isomorphic. And then I will tell you what needs to be uh, you know, changed in bookkeeping in order to create an infinite genus. Okay? The algebras will be very much concrete, but the field will be very large and, and out of different world. So namely, let's start with two non-isomorphic quaternion algebras, D1 and D2, that have a common maximal subfield. Okay? We can be very much concrete, so we can just take these two algebras. The first one is ramified at 2 and 3, and the other uh, is ramified at 2 and 7, so over the field of rational numbers. Now, if it happens that uh, the algebras have the same maximal subfields, we're done. Usually this doesn't happen. So we have an extension that embeds into one algebra, but does not embed into the other. To be very much concrete, in this case, so 11 is not a square mod 3, so this Q adjoint square root of 11 embeds into D1, but 11 is a square mod 7, therefore Q adjoint square root of 11 does not embed into D2. Okay? What we do next is we construct an extension K1 of K so that the algebras remain non-isomorphic, but after this base change, K1 adjoint uh, square root of D1 already embedded into D2. Okay. This can be done if we take for K1 the function field of a certain quadric. To be concrete in our concrete division algebras, <coughs> so we can take this quadric. So here you, of course, recognize the imaginary part of the reduced norm from the second algebra, and we want it to represent 11. Therefore, we better take this quadric. So uh, the second condition is now very much clear. So this first condition requires some work. So we need to use certain results about Pista forms to show that the algebras remain non-isomorphic. Okay. Now, this algebra d1 times d2 in the Brouwer group will be the algebra negative 1, 21. So here is the reduced norm. So the point is that it follows from the results on Pfister forms that this form remains anisotropic over the uh, field of functions of that quadric. So they both have four variables, but the discriminant of this is not a square. So that, that, that's how it's shown. But it's a non-trivial fact. Okay. Again, if now all our algebras have the same subfields after the base change, we're done. Typically, this is not what happens. So we find D2 that embeds into one, but does not embed into the other. And then you iterate the procedure. So you construct a certain extension similarly. Okay. And this generates a, a, a tower of extensions, obviously. Uh, I'm not 
talking about the details of, of bookkeeping keep, here, but so generally this generates a tower extensions, and for the required field, we take the limit of that tower. Okay. And then by our construction, so the algebras remain non-isomorphic. Okay. This is because if they become isomorphic, this should happen at some finite stage. But by construction, again, they will have the same maximal subtotals. Of course, here I'm moving only from D1 to D2. You need to go back and forth infinitely many times. But so it's, it's sort of easy to explain. It's not easy to write down. But this can be done. This is how you construct this, this field so that your very concrete division algebras that were non-isomorphic and remain non-isomorphic will have the same maximal subfields. And it's clear that, you know, to, to construct infinite genus, you probably can take this, this family of algebras where P is a prime, which is 3 mod 4, and do something similar. Of course, note that here this field script K is huge. So remember, at each stage, we adjoin, uh, we construct the function field of certain quadric. So ki over ki minus 1 is of transcendence degree 3. So the resulting field will, of course, will have infinite transcendence degree. So of course, this field never occurs if you look at Riemann surfaces, the corresponding quaternion uh, uh, algebras. OK. Uh, and that's precisely the reason. Namely, all finitely generated fields will have the following result. So if k is a finitely generated field, then given any algebra of degree prime to the characteristic, the genus is always finite. So both theorems, the first one was the stability theorem, and the second one is this finitist result, uh, use two ingredients. The analysis of, of ramification, which I will mention a bit later, and then some information about the unramified Brouwer group. More precisely, there is the following basic fact. So if we have a discrete valuation of k, and if we have two algebras that have the same maximal subfields, then they are either both ramified or un unramified. Again, I'm not going to get into details and define rigorously what it means to be ramified. So there are so-called residue maps on Galaco homology, and an algebra is called unramified if its image under that map is trivial. Another way to think about unramified algebras is the, like as algebras with integral structure. So an algebra is unramified if it comes from a certain Azumaya algebra defined over the evaluation ring. And then. To prove the finiteness of the genus, one simply needs to show that a finitely generated field can be equipped with a set of discrete relations so that the corresponding unramified Brouwer group, or more precisely, the end torsion, n is fixed, the end torsion in the corresponding unramified Brouwer group is finite. And now let me finish this part of the talk with the following question. We still don't know if one can construct a quaternion division algebras over a nice field with non-trivial genus. So we would love to have an example or a field of rational functions on a certain curve defined over a number field. But we could also settle for, you know, at this point, for any finitely generated field. So as I told you, so what we use in these theorems is the analysis of ramification. And it's easy to construct two non isomorphic algebras that have the same ramification. That would be the candidates. But we have not been able to show that they will have the same, the same subfield. So this seems to be difficult at this point. Okay. Are there any questions? What's your well, if the genus. That would be great if the genus is trivial. But then this will make our finance results meaningless. <laughs> but I, I would be very happy if, for some reason, for some magic reason, but at this point I don't see this reason, that you know, the, the genus of any 
Cotanian algebra or finitely generated field is, is, is Yeah, we don't know. I mean, we tried, but it, when you go to the field, like uh, the field of functions on the elliptic curve, it's not exactly clear how to show that two periodic forms represent the same. Because the abstraction to the local global principle is of the same size as, as your unramified Brown group. It is unramified Brown group. So you, you have to be very cre creative to show that. Uh, you can check this locally, of course, but the abstraction uh, we have not been able to overcome this yet. <coughs> well, in other words, what, what, what these two results give us some understanding of what happens for division algebras. But then probably one would like to ask, well, what happens with algebras with involution? In which case, of course, you are probably allowed only to look at the subfields that are invariant under the involution. But there are several kinds of involutions, and you don't want to go and analyzing each maybe kind separately. So it's much better to put this problem in the context of algebraic groups. Because then it turns out to be related with other interesting questions like uh, groups with good reduction at a given set of places, and local global principle, and things like that. Of course, the definition of genus is very easy to extend. So to define the genus of an algebraic group, or rather simple algebraic group, we simply replace maximal subfields with maximal tori in the definition. Namely, we make the following definition. So if we have two semi-simple groups over a field K, then we say that they have the same isomorphism classes of maximal tori if every K to maximal K torus of one of them is K isomorphic to a maximal torus in the other, and vice versa. And then, uh, we define the genus of an algebraic group as the set of k isomorphism classes of k forms of G having the same isomorphism classes of maximal tori. So let me remind you that when I say k form, well, what I mean by that is a k defined algebraic group that becomes isomorphic to G or the algebraic closure. So essentially, what this means is that uh, uh, it has the same Lie type if both, let's say, let's take only simply connected groups and so on. So basically, we're looking at groups of the same Lie type that have the same isomorphism classes of, of uh, maximal tori. Well, and then probably would like to also to answer the same questions, first of all. When does the genus reduce to a single element? So this means that our group is uniquely determined by the isomorphism classes of its maximal k tori. And then we would like to know when is the genus finite? Both questions can be resolved over number fields. So in our work with, with Gopal, we proved the following. So the genus is always finite. And in fact, unless G is one of the following three bed types, the genus reduces to one element. So for experts, so let me mention that these are precisely the types where a negative one is not in the wild group. Uh, again, a little bit of a surprise is that D2N type behaves differently from D2N plus one type. And we also know that these three types are honest, uh, honest exceptions. Namely, for each of them, just as in the case of division algebras, the genus or a fixed field can be arbitrarily large. And what we're trying to do now is we're trying to work out those questions over fields uh, more general. Yeah? The question, uh, the connectivity really uh, matters here? Yeah? I mean, simply connected changes something? Or? No. 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 no, I mean, you, you can also do a joint, obviously. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I can explain. So it, no, no, no. it really doesn't matter. So 
the way it's written, it's written for simply connected because we use the Hasse principle, but things like that. But, uh, but uh, I mean, this can be inc incorporated into construction, can construct you know, adjoining groups just as well. I can add that, you know, in fact, maximal theory can see whether your group is simply connected or adjoined over finitely generated fields. But let me not, you know, get in, in, into this. So you really need to look at groups of the same type and, you know, either simply connected or adjoined. Uh, we have been able to, to extend the general strategy uh, Used on, uh, based on the analysis of, of ramification to arbitrary groups, but the definitive results, as we will see, are available only in relatively few cases. And there are reasons for that. So what, when we work with division algebras, division algebras are parameterized by the Brouwer group. So in other words, division algebras are classified, as we say, by cohomological invariance. It's not known if the forms of any type can be classified by cohomological invariance. Okay. But even if they can, for example, take type G2, it's classified by H3. Okay. We were able to prove the finiteness of unramified H2. The finiteness of unramified H3 is a notoriously difficult problem. I will show you some results, but the general case remains wide open. For, for a variety of reasons, so the spectral sequence becomes too complicated to, to analyze and, and, and so on. <coughs> uh, let me uh, show you what we would like to prove. So to answer question one prime, so if we have a purely transcendental extension of a number field, we believe that the following should be true. So the, if we take a group G with small center, whose center has order not more than two, then the genus should, should reduce to one element. So this covers groups like G2, F4, Cn, uh, Bn, uh, E7. Okay. And then we also believe that if G is an absolutely almost simple group or a finitely generated field of good characteristic, then the genus should define it. Now, a characteristic that does not divide the order of the vital group is certainly good. But it seems that for types like Bn and Cn, it would be enough to exclude just two. So it's better than the usual notion of, of bad prime for, for an algebraic group. Uh, here's, here's what we can prove at, at that point. So first, let me observe that the results for division algebras do not automatically imply the corresponding results for the norm one groups. There are at least two reasons why. One is, well, imagine so that the degree of D can in principle be divisible by the characteristic. Okay, and then your algebra can contain inseparable subfields. These inseparable subfields do not give rise to maximal tori. Okay. Therefore, this, uh, so when you just allow yourself to have information about maximal tori, uh, these fields drop out. So you don't get information of them. There is a more serious reason. So if we have a division algebra, D, and we take the corresponding SL1D group, then uh, maximal tori are simply the norm one tori associated to the maximal subfields of D. What can happen is that you can have two extensions of the same degree, L1 and L2, so that the corresponding tori are isomorphic as algebraic groups, as algebraic tori. But the extensions are not isomorphic. Okay. How common this is, I don't know. I know only one example, but this can happen. So therefore, uh, if we just know that our norm one groups uh, 
uh, contain isomorphic tori, we cannot say that the underlying division algebras have the same maximal subfields. Okay? But it's slightly tweaking the argument that we used for, for division algebras. One can prove that uh, if we have a central division algebra of exponent 2 over a purely transcendent extension of a number field, then the genus of the algebraic group SLMD is always reduces to one element. So these groups are uniquely determined by their maximal tori. And then if the degree of D is prime to the characteristic, the genus is finite. Recently, we obtained you know, some results for Spinner and other groups. And, but at this point, these are available only in the situ situation, oh, I'm sorry, uh, where our field is rather special. So our field is a function field of a certain uh, curve defined over a number field. Then in each of the following cases, the Spinner group, the unitary group, over uh, Hermitian form. Can, can you say when, when you allow, when you start with your field having a transcendental element, how you use it? I mean, you, your results are much stronger when the base field K is K of X, right? Yes. And why have you used it? Are you using some? Uh, you, you, need, you need to compute the cohomology of curves. Yeah. Okay. So, of course, if, if you have uh, just P1, then we know what happens. So that the unidentified part is precisely the constant part. So in general, of course, you need there are certain sequence, exact sequences. That, for example, if you look at the Brouwer group of a curve, there are two components to it. One comes from constants, okay? So H H two of constants. The other is H one of the Picard. So these are two components, and we analyze those components. So simply when. Uh, we have a purely transcendental extension, so there is no picard. Right. <laughs> and that's the, the reason. And also we have you know, similar results for, for type G2. So if we have a purely transcendental extension of a number field, the genus always reduces to one element, but Again, in certain situations, so including uh, the case where the field is, is a function field of a curve or a purely transcendental extension of K, the genus is, is finite. So we have some data, but as you see at this point, it's, it, it's uh, quite limited. So now let me tell you briefly how we generalize the analysis of ramification to, to algebraic groups. So and adequate substitute for the notion of a ramified division algebra is the notion of an algebraic group with good reduction. So here is a formal definition. So we have an absolutely almost simple algebraic group defined over a field K, and we have a discrete relation of K. So we say that you know, G has good reduction if there is a re reductive group scheme over the evaluation ring. So whose genetic fiber is your G, and whose special fiber is a connected simple algebraic group of the same type as G. That's the usual definition. So in particular cases, it, it means what it's supposed to mean. So if we have an SL1D group, then it has good reduction, even only if your division algebra comes from a certain Azumaya algebra or the evaluation ring. So it's, it means that our D is unramified. So when we talk about spinner groups, then it has good reduction. If you can, you know, of course, you are allowed to scale your form Q without changing your group. So, and what you want is you, after scaling, you want your form to be defined really over the, over the valuation ring. Now, the main result is the following. <coughs> In this sort of a situation, so suppose we have an absolutely almost simple group and we have a discrete valuation of K. Here we need to impose one extra assumption. So we want the residue field uh, to be uh, finitely generated. Okay? And now let's also assume that G itself has good reduction at V. Then it happens that every single group in the genus also has good reduction at this V. And one can say more. So the groups obtained uh, after reduction will also have the same tori. 
Uh, so now, suppose we have a, a, a finitely generated field. I'm moving. I'm trying to move closer to explaining the idea of how one can possibly prove the finiteness of the genus. Now, suppose we have a finitely generated field, and suppose it's equipped with a certain set of discrete valuations. Now, we need two technical conditions, which are usually satisfied. So first of all, if you have a non-zero element, that it's a unit almost everywhere. And then we also need to know that the residue fields are finitely generated. So yeah? I'm sorry you suddenly said this, but what do you mean by uh, finitely generated? Here? It's finitely generated over uh, its prime subfield. About the prime subfield. But when you have a number field, then you have periodic completions. So right. So we, we incorporate periodic completions as well. Oh, oh, okay. For example, if, if you take thing like z box x so that's the integral model you know like a, a1 then we have two sorts of valuations so uh, those that come from primes yes. so and those that come from irreducible polynomials okay. and so uh, for the prime the finite primes what do you mean by finitely generated it's not finitely generated over q obviously you said over the prime sub subfield that's right so what what does it mean for the completions? No, no, I'm not talking about completions. That's the residue uh, field. Just before, yeah, no, no, that's the residue field. Sorry, oh, uh, it's, the residue it's the residue field. Sorry, I, I probably no. didn't explain this. It, it's the residue field. So we call such sets obviously divisorial. So they correspond to prime devices on a certain scheme of finite type. Something like that. But what you should keep in mind is that you know the sets of relations that will come up later are basically models on this sort of situation. So we have you have an, uh, a model over some number ring or something like that, and then you have two uh, parts of your set. One comes from the constant relations, and the other comes from the geometric places. Then the following happens. So now suppose we have an absolutely almost simple simply connected group. Then we can throw out a finite subset from V, and this subset will depend on G, so that every single group in the genus will have good reduction at all V except you know, places in S. So to prove the finiteness, of course, one would like to do the following. So everything reduced to the following question. Can we now equip a given finitely generated field with a set of discrete valuations that has the following property, the following finiteness condition? So the set of k isomorphism classes of forms of G that have good reduction almost everywhere is finite. So uh, and of course, to prove the finiteness of the genus now, it's enough to construct that set of relations. Unfortunately, verifying this finiteness condition phi turned out, turns out to be not so easy. So for example, when we did this for spinner groups, we had to use Miller's conjecture, and which reduces uh, to the finiteness of certain unramified cohomology groups. And second, we had to prove the finiteness of that unreified cohomology groups. And the most difficult case for number fields is dimension three. Namely, dimension two is the Brouwer group. We know that for all finitely generated fields. For dimensions four and higher, the finiteness follows from uh, poor to Tate easily, or by some other means. So the crucial case is three. Now, if C is projective, and we are allowed to include into V all the geometric places, this can be derived from the results of Kata and Janssen on, on Hasse principle. But that was not good enough for our purposes because, like I said, so we need to be able to exclude any finite set from V. So we need the case where C is a fine. So we were able to do that, but I mean, that's, that's a, bit, a bit technical. But as I said earlier, so we are able to check this only for spinner groups in this very concrete situation, but presumably the same set of relations should work in all cases. Like I said, if we are working with the field Q of X, we are talking about the set 
that contains all relations com coming from the field of constants plus all irreducible polynomials. This set should, should work conjecturally in, in all situations. Well, I should say that uh, the benefits of having such a set V are not reduced just to having finite genus. Another consequence is that if we look at this global to local map in Galois homology, and we know that our set V satisfies our finite condition phi, then this map will be proper. Namely, the image, the pre-image of any finite set will be finite. In particular, the kernel of this map, which is the tate shafarevich set, uh, would be finite. Uh, and we know for a fact that it's true if you take PSLN over any finitely generated field, or you take, for example, SO uh, over the field of the function field of a certain curve. We also know this for type G2 and also in other situations. But again, it seems that it will eventually lead to a more general phenomenon. So there are some other consequences that I don't have time to talk about. They are related to the risky dense subgroups uh, of, of algebraic groups. And finally, so I have like five minutes left. So let me show you some results that we call killing the genus. So I should have given that talk on Halloween, you know, on, on, on Tuesday. <laughs> uh, but uh, before I kill anything, so here's one more <laughs> uh, consequence of theorem seven. Theorem seven was that if the group itself is unramified, then everything in the genus is unramified. Here's one consequence of that. So suppose we have uh, an absolute almost simple algebraic group over a finite unity field. Here it's better to say of characteristic zero. And now I would like to do the base change from little k to a purely transcendental extension. So what happens is that then uh, the genus acquires nothing new. So anything in the genus over this pure transcendental extension actually comes from the genus over the base, base field. So in, in particular, if the genus over the base field was finite, it will remain finite after this base change to uh, pure transcendental extension. Well, of course, iterating, you get this not only for one variable, but for several variables. However, I am not saying that whenever you had something in the genus or the base field, it will remain in the genus after the field extension. On the contrary, the following happens to be true. And that's our killing series. So if we have a group of type G2 or a finitely generated field, so if we do the base change to a purely transcendental extension, we need to adjoin six variables. The genus gets completely killed. The genus or that purely transcendental extension becomes trivial. And the proof, I mean, uses certain properties of, of uh, feast of. Well, the six means because if, <laughs> if you uh, every group of type G two is associated to a certain form in eight variables. Okay, you set it equal to zero. That's your field, but you can ho homogenize it so it, it will have transcendence degree seven. But if you homogenize, you can get it down to six. Uh, and we have an analog of, of this fact also for SL1D groups. Here, the statement is slightly different. Of course, we know that the genus cannot get killed completely, as she observed, so, but it can get as small as possible. So namely, if we have a division algebra of degree n, then if we do the base change to a purely transcendental extension of degree n minus 1, the genus becomes as small as, as possible. So it will be generated uh, by those classes that have generated the same thing in, in, in the Brouwer group. So in particular, the genus always becomes small. The proof uses, again, certain facts. I mean, source theorems. And uh, the fact that was, you know, I don't know if it's really mentioned in the literature. So the function field on the Severy Brouwer variety is actually a degree n extension of a purely transcendental extension. So to put it simple, so for quaternions, we have the following. So 
take any quaternion algebra over any field of characteristic node 2. And again, you can take the one that has infinite genus. Then, when you pass to a pure transcendental extension of degree just one, the whole genus gets killed. And again, conjecturally, so results of this type should be true, uh, of, of that kind should be true for, for all types, but that's work in progress. Thank you very much. <laughs>